What is it about being British that matters to you? What is it about being black that matters to you? What is it about being working class that matters to you? Because any one of those categories, black, working class, British, contains a lot of really awful people. Identity is a very important place to start, but it's a terrible place to finish. And that's where some people, or too many people, that's where they end their story. I'm this, and I'm not going to talk about anything else. I'm lots of things. I'm black and British. I was working class. I am middle class. I'm a journalist. I'm a professor. I'm straight. I'm male. And I'm also just one thing, Gary. Race never operates alone. It operates with a bunch of rogue characters, class, gender, sexual orientation, region, ability. It is one identity among many. And actually, to try and understand race without those other aspects is to misunderstand it completely. Race isn't real. We think we know what it is. But actually, what it is, is a social construct to understand the world that racism built. If you look at people's genetic makeup, 99% of it is all the same. But thanks primarily to the slave trade, there had to be a rationale for why some people were enslaved and other people weren't. And so they came up with a logic that the people who were enslaved were less like people. They were less intelligent, they were less human, and therefore there was a range of things that you could do with them. Now, this doesn't have to be about colour. Racism isn't just black and white. It can operate in all sorts of contexts. I would call it racism against the Irish. They were white. British people were white. But when it came down to it, when people came to this country in the 50s and 60s, there were no dogs, no blacks, no Irish. So racism is always better understood as a system than as a set of personal values. There is this effort, this crude, nasty effort, not to see our differences, because there are differences. There are cultural, racial, national differences. I don't have a problem with that. I don't have a problem with discriminating between people. I have this problem with discriminating against people. Actually, recognizing difference is a very important thing. Actually, the space for that has become more and more narrow for understanding people and moments for what they are and for what is common about them as opposed to the things that make us different. Race may be a construct. Racism is a reality. From cradle to grave, more likely to die in infancy, more likely to die in pregnancy, more likely to be expelled, less likely to get a job on graduation if you're lucky enough to go to university, more likely to be unemployed, more likely to suffer mental health problems, more likely to be poorly housed. In all sorts of ways, black people fall not just foul of the law of the land, they fall foul of the law of probabilities. And this is not an accident. The most daily, banal forms of racism, the institutional, systemic racism, the racism that you can't share on a video, but it's the racism that we live with every day. And then at the end, there's Black Lives Matter, which shows that the ability of America to put a black man in the White House is no longer contested. But the ability of a black youth to walk down the street and not get shot dead, the ability of a black man to be questioned and not murdered, that's still an open question. And so there's a range of ways in which clearly things have got better. And it would be a disservice to the people who campaigned and worked hard to make those things better to suggest that that isn't true. But there are even more things that have stayed the same or got worse. While symbols are not insubstantial, they should not be confused with substance either. We have to be in a constant state of vigilance about what advances are truly symbolic and what advances are truly substantial and what advances are in the trajectory of becoming substantial. If we don't do that, we run the risk of dismissing everything that is gained. Ah, what does it matter if a black man becomes president? But if we don't have a critical eye on it, then you get people claiming it as everything. That Obama's victory proves that black people can be equal. That the fact that we have a brown prime minister shows X, Y, Z. They do nothing of the sort. When I interviewed Angela Davis, she says there is an understanding of diversity as the difference that brings no difference and the change that brings no change which is a very powerful notion, that you can look different and act the same. And if we think about racism as a system, then actually, if the system's working, it doesn't matter whose hands are on it. It could be black hands, it could be brown hands, they could be white hands. If that wasn't evident before, it should be from the awful business that happened in Memphis, where most of the cops were black. But once you have a system of policing in place, that 
no longer becomes quite the contradiction that people think it is. And so what matters is to change the system. Often the successes are individual and the setbacks are collective, but not always. And quite often the successes that are individual speak to some collective advance that the individual would not have been able to make that move without the collective progress. And almost always, the individual successes of middle-class black people in the West are intimately and intricately related to the advances that are made among working-class people. But those working-class black people generally aren't the ones who benefit. Arundhati Roy has a great analogy of the Thanksgiving turkey in America. Every year, the president pardons one turkey. And that turkey is not fried, it goes back to the turkey farm. She's talking about the handful of people who managed to get through. And she compares them to the Thanksgiving turkey that is pardoned. And she says, all the rest, they're all for the pan. But one turkey gets through. And then people say, how can turkeys be against Thanksgiving? That one's fine. And so they highlight on the individual one that gets through and use them when they're the exception and they assert that they are the rule. You know, it's only really stupid or arrogant people who think they do it all by themselves. There are people who went before me who created the space that made me possible. They didn't do it for me. The tragedy is a large number of the people who created that space didn't benefit from that space, which is why I feel that there is a responsibility in my work. I grew up black in a town where most people were white and working class. My life has taken a fortunate turn. I feel a relationship to the working class, but I'm not of them anymore. I feel a relationship to the middle class, but I don't feel entirely of them. I feel a relationship to black people, but I didn't grow up around that many of them. That's been a learned relationship. I feel British, but I also didn't grow up feeling British. And so I've grown with a sense that my people are my community. And they can be anywhere. And that was a gift that British racism gave to me, really. Because I grew up with people going, it's pretty cold, isn't it? But it's not like this where you come from. And think, well, I come from just down the road. But obviously, that doesn't work for you. So I'm going to have to imagine, well, you know, we supported Wales for rugby and Brazil at football and West Indies at Queen. We never supported England growing up. That's quite a new thing for me. So in all of these ways I would fly a flag of convenience and had to kind of construct my identity as I went along and that didn't come from a position of strength and there's a range of ways in which I wish it had been easier but I was glad for it. It forced me to think. One of the main inspirations in my journalism and my life is my mum. My mum came to this country when she was 18, 19, British passport from Barbados. She's going to be a nurse. She was sent up to Derby. She meets my dad. They have three kids. I'm the youngest. Then my dad leaves when I'm one. She's a psychiatric nurse. We'd moved to Stevenage. Yes, she's got these three kids. And it's the early 70s, which racially is not a great time in Britain. She used to play Young, Gifted and Black. She'd say, oh, they're playing our song. And she had to build this notion from thin air, really, about whom we might be, about what might be possible. There were very few possibilities. It was always assumed that we would go to university. She didn't go to university. Most of my mates from school didn't go to university, but it was always assumed that we would by her. She was a feminist, she was an anti-colonialist, she was a socialist, and she would never have used any of those words about herself. And yet those were the principles that were inculcated into me. She did a lot of youth work. Now, Stephen is overwhelmingly white. She would say, these are our people. She made me stay up and watch the Holocaust miniseries. And she was like, these are your people. Like, this is your story too. She had that kind of very militant sense of humanism. And then a lot of racist stuff would go down. And she would have to intervene and be like, well, what's going on here? You know, why are you treating my kid like that? That's not on. And so... I was raised with this sense that the space that you were going to occupy in the world hasn't been defined yet. You're going to have to define it. That the plans for you that exist do not do you justice. So you must make plans for yourself. And then my mum died when I was 19 and she was 44, very young. And even in her death, there were these lessons. And one was like, life is short and frail. And I felt like my mum did what she needed to do while she was on the planet and bequeathed to me and my brothers, you need to do what you need to do while you're on the planet. You don't know how long you're going to be here. There's a bit of me that can go a bit Oprah Winfrey because I am an unlikely thing. 
When my mum was panning around the house with me singing Young, Gifted and Black, she couldn't have imagined the life that I would have as a journalist. I picketed the South African Embassy with my mum. She couldn't have imagined that. Eight years later, I would be travelling with Mandela's cavalcade, hanging around with his bodyguard. She couldn't have imagined that. And so I'm the product of an unlikely journey. Now as a professor, that wasn't in the stars at all. And that does shape my feeling that the world we want to build, maybe we can't see it yet, but we have to believe that it's possible. In the same way that Martin Luther King didn't go up to the steps of Lincoln Memorial and say, I have a 10 point plan. He said, I have a dream. And then he dreamt of something that no one could have thought was possible in that moment. That engaged people in a very particular way. And so when I think about the future, I think it could be rational to despair. Global warming, stagnant wages, rising xenophobia. But then you look at the strikes. And then you look at the anti-racist movement and you look at the range of ways in which people are fighting back. And it's my decision in a way, my personal decision, not to despair, but to embrace that spirit that my mum had when she had me padding around the house and couldn't see what my future would be, but had to believe in it, to believe that we have a better future. And so I feel that I'm the product of a certain kind of hope. There is a phrase that the realists often use, which is, Politics is the art of the possible. And I like to think that radicalism is the art of imagining different possibilities and then fighting for the world that you want. Going beyond just what we can see, which is often inadequate. Thinking Paulo Freire, the Brazilian educator and radical, said, what can we do today so that tomorrow we can do what we couldn't do today? And that's the essential of activism. You can't just imagine a world and conjure it into life. But if you don't imagine the world that you want to live in, then where are you going? And the world that I want to live in, I can't see it right now, but I know that it's possible. I feel that it's possible. And that's enough for me. Independent media is important. Places like Double Down News is where we get takes that we're not going to find in the mainstream. So become a patron, give it your money, support Double Down News.